According to Wikipedia, typology in Christian theology and in biblical exegesis is a doctrine or theory concerning the relationship of the Old Testament to the New Testament. Typology is very useful for grasping truths about the Catholic faith because it is both at the same time simple and profound. Through typology, people, places, and events from the Old Testament are seen as a foreshadowing or a prefigurement of people, places, and events in the New Testament. Typology uses storytelling to deepen our understanding about the Catholic faith. And this is much like the approach that our Lord took to explaining truth, as he spoke in parables and in stories so that everyone could understand. Please listen prayerfully and open your hearts to see the typological prefigurements that lie waiting for us in the Old Testament. Before we examine how Constantine was prefigured in the Old Testament by Moses, I would like to offer an idea. The Old Testament contains the entire history of the Israelites. The Israelites were the Old Testament people of God. Their entire history, from their inception until their ending, is completely contained in the books of the Old Testament. Similarly, the New Testament is the entire history of the new people of God, the Catholic Church. The New Testament really contains our entire history from start to finish. However, the difference is that for the Israelites, their history is entirely recorded in the Bible. Our history is still being lived out. We are still in the New Testament, even though our history is not recorded entirely in the Bible. With that concept in mind, it becomes clear why Constantine would be prefigured in the pages of the Old Testament. If the Old prefigures the New, then events in the history of the Church would be prefigured by the Old Testament. It's not just people, places, and events from the pages of the books of the New Testament, but it's the actual history of our church that comprises the actual New Testament. Now we are ready to see how Constantine is prefigured in the Old Testament by the life and events of Moses. The story of Moses stretches through the last four books of the Pentateuch in the Old Testament. The birth of Moses occurs in the second chapter of the book of Exodus. The story of his life continues through the books of Numbers, Leviticus, and finally his death is recorded in the book of Deuteronomy. Because of the vast amount of scripture concerning Moses, it would be too lengthy to go over all of them in this video. For that reason, just the scriptures that are relevant to the prefigurement of Constantine will be examined. Moses is perhaps most well known for setting the Israelites free from their bondage in Egypt. Moses, when he was a child, was sent down the Nile River by his mother to protect him from murder. Moses was taken in by Pharaoh's daughter and raised as a prince of Egypt even though his mother was an Israelite. From the book of Exodus chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. After this there went a man of the house of Levi, and took a wife of his own kindred. And she conceived and bore a son, and seeing him a goodly child, hid him three months. And when she could hide him no longer, she took a basket made of bulrushes, and daubed it with slime and pitch and put the little babe therein, and laid him in the sedges by the river's brink. His sister standing afar off, and taking notice what would be done. And behold, the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself in the river, and her maids walked by the river's brink. 
And when she saw the basket in the sedges, she sent one of her maids for it. And when it was brought, she opened it, and seeing within it an infant crying, having compassion on it, she said, This is one of the babes of the Hebrews. And the child's sister said to her, Shall I go and call to thee a Hebrew woman to nurse the babe? She answered, Go. The maid went and called her mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Take this child and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. The woman took and nursed the child, and when he was grown up, she delivered him to Pharaoh's daughter. And she adopted him for a son and called him Moses, saying, Because I took him out of the water. While part of Pharaoh's royal house, Moses kills an Egyptian guard who is abusing an Israelite slave. Moses runs away because Pharaoh is seeking to kill him. Moses goes far away to the land of Midian where he marries a Midianite woman. It is in his time in exile that God speaks to Moses and gives him his mission and his authority. However, even though Moses is called by God, he still puts off circumcising his son. Moses was supposed to teach God's law, but he was not even fulfilling it himself. There's a passage in scripture that describes this, and it's difficult to understand. And it could also mean that Moses himself was not circumcised. There are credible arguments that support both interpretations. From the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verses 11 and 12. In those days, after Moses was grown up, he went out to his brethren and saw their affliction, and an Egyptian striking one of the Hebrews, his brethren. And when he had looked about this way and that way, and saw no one was there, he slew the Egyptian and hid him in the sand. And from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 15. And Pharaoh heard of this and sought to kill Moses. But he fled from his sight, and he abode in the land of Midian, and he sat down by a well. And finally, from the book of Exodus, chapter 2, verse 21. And Moses swore that he would dwell with him and he took Sephora, his daughter, to wife. From the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 1 and 2. Now Moses fed the sheep of Jethro, his father-in-law, the priest of Midian, and he drove the flock to the inner parts of the desert, and he came to the mountain of God, Horeb. And the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. And finally, the passage of scripture describing Moses' failure to circumcise his son and potentially himself as well. From the book of Exodus, chapter 3, verses 24 and 25. And when he was in his journey, in the inn, the Lord met him and would have killed him. Immediately, Sephora took a very sharp stone and circumcised the foreskin of her son and touched his feet and said, a bloody spouse art thou to me. Moses returns to Egypt to free the Israelites from bondage. After a series of plagues, God instructs Moses to have the Israelites paint their doorposts with lamb's blood. This will mark the doors of the believers, and through it they will be set free and conquer their enemies. Soon after, the Israelites are set free, and they are then pursued by Pharaoh. Pharaoh ends up drowning in the Red Sea, along with most of his army. With the death of Pharaoh and his army, the threat to Israel is over. The Israelites start their journey through the desert to the Promised Land. However, Moses does not make it to the Promised Land, and he dies right before he gets there. 
from the book of Exodus chapter 12 verse 7 and they shall take the blood thereof and put it upon the side posts and on the upper door post of the houses wherein they shall eat it from the book of Exodus chapter 15 verses 4 through 5 Pharaoh's chariots and his army he has cast into the sea. His chosen captains are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They are sunk to the bottom like a stone. And from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 34, verses 4 through 5. And the Lord said to him, This is the land for which I have swore to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, saying, I will give it to thy seed. Thou hast seen it with thy eyes, and shall not pass over to it. And Moses the servant of the Lord died there in the land of Moab by the commandment of the Lord. Now that we have accounted for certain events in the life of Moses, we can move on to the life of Constantine, a complex and somewhat controversial emperor of Rome who legalized Christianity. Constantine was emperor of Rome from the year 306 to 337 AD. It was Constantine who legalized Christianity and delivered the Christians from the threat of persecution. After just having suffered through the great persecutions of Emperors Decius and Diocletian. During this time in Roman history, there were two emperors, as Diocletian had split the empire in two to better manage its vast area. Constantine, at one time, was one of two reigning emperors. Constantine's mother was Saint Helena, a devout and holy Catholic woman. From Wikipedia, Constantine was the first emperor to stop Christian persecutions and to legalize Christianity along with all other religions and cults in the Roman Empire. Constantine was the son of Flavius Valerius Constantius, a Roman army officer, and his consort Helena. The term tetrarchy describes any form of government where power is divided among four individuals, but in modern usage usually refers to the system instituted by Roman Emperor Diocletian in the year 293, marking the end of the crisis of the 3rd century and the recovery of the Roman Empire. This tetrarchy lasted until 313 AD when internecine conflict eliminated most of the claimants to power, leaving Constantine in control of the western half of the empire and Licinius in control of the eastern half. Constantine was raised in the court of Diocletian and became a tribune of the first order in that court. Constantine was a member of that court when Diocletian issued his great edict of persecution of Christians. Soon Diocletian resigned and the title of emperor passed to Galerius. Galerius made attempts on Constantine's life on several occasions and for his safety Constantine fled from the court of Galerius at night and he ran far away to England. It was in England that he was to be raised to power after the death of his father. Constantine received a formal education at Diocletian's court. Constantine was nonetheless a prominent member of the court, and by late 305 AD he had become a tribune of the First Order, a Tribunus Ordinis Primi. Constantine had returned to Nicomedia from the Eastern Front by the spring of 303 AD, 
in time to witness the beginnings of Diocletian's great persecution, the most severe persecution of Christians in Roman history. On May 1st, 305 AD, Diocletian, as a result of a delibitating sickness, taken in the winter of 304 to 305 AD, he announced his resignation. Constantius and Galerius were promoted to Augusti. Some of the ancient sources detail plots that Galerius made on Constantine's life in the months following Diocletian's abdication. Constantine recognized the implicit danger in remaining at Galerius's court where he was held as a virtual hostage. His career depended on him being rescued by his father in the West. Constantius was quick to intervene. In the late spring or early summer of 305, Constantius requested leave for his son to help him campaign in Britain. After a long evening of drinking, Galerius granted the request. Constantine's later propaganda describes how he fled the court in the night before Galerius could change his mind. He rode from post house to post house at high speed, hamstringing every horse in his wake. By the time Galerius woke the following morning, Constantine had fled too far to be caught. Constantine joined his father in Gaul and at Bononia before the summer of 305 AD. And from Bononia, they crossed the channel to Britain and made their way to Baracum or York, capital of the province of Britannia Secunda, and home to a large military base. Constantine was able to spend a year in northern Britain. Before dying, Constantius declared his support for raising Constantine to the rank of full Augustus. The Alemannic king Crocus a barbarian taken into service under Constantius, then proclaimed Constantine, Constantine as the Augustus. The troops loyal to Constantius' memory followed him in acclamation. Gaul and Britain quickly accepted his rule. After Constantine is raised to be the Emperor of the West, and after the death of his father Constantine, a series of imperial intrigues and power struggles ensued. Eventually, Constantine found himself at war with Maxentius, who had gained control of power in Italy and was headquartered in the city of Rome. The night before the battle, in which Constantine would gain victory over Maxentius, he had a vision in the sky in which God told Constantine he would conquer with a sign. The sign Constantine saw was most likely a cross, or the chi Rho, as seen here. Constantine marked the sign on his shields of his army. Even though he was greatly outnumbered, Constantine defeated Maxentius at Milvan Bridge, over the Tiber River in Rome. Maxentius and a large part of his army drowned in the Tiber River, and one can imagine that the Tiber River turned red with blood the day of that battle. Maxentius organized his forces, still twice the size of Constantine's, in long lines facing the battle plain, with their backs to the river. Constantine's army arrived at the field bearing unfamiliar symbols on either its standards or its soldier shields. According to Lactantius, Constantine was visited by a dream the night before the battle, wherein he was advised to mark the heavenly sign of God on the shields of his soldiers by means of a slanted letter X with the top of its head bent round. He marked Christ on their shields. Mesuebius describes another version where, while marching at midday, he saw with his own eyes in the heavens a trophy of the cross arising from the light of the sun, carrying the message, In hoc signo vinces, or, With this sign you will conquer. In Asuebius' account, Constantine had a dream the following night, 
in which Christ appeared with the same heavenly sign and told him to make a standard, the labarum, for his army in that form. Constantine deployed his own forces along the whole length of Maxentius's line. He ordered his cavalry to charge, and they broke Maxentius's cavalry. And they sent his infantry against Maxentius's infantry, pushing many into the Tiber, where they were slaughtered and drowned. The battle was brief. Maxentius's troops were broken before the first charge. Maxentius's horse guards and Praetorians initially held their position but broke under the force of a Constantinian cavalry charge. They also bro broke ranks and fled into the river. Maxentius rode with him and attempted to cross the bridge of boats, but he was pushed by the mass of his fleeing soldiers into the Tiber and he drowned. Even though Constantine is credited with ending the persecution of Christians in the empire, he himself did not get baptized until right at the end of his life. A controversy surrounds his baptism, since he was not baptized by a Catholic bishop, but instead by an Arian or a heretical bishop. Constantine was on the way to Persia on a military campaign. He planned on stopping at the Jordan River where he planned on being baptized just as our Lord was baptized at the Jordan River. However, before he got there, he became very sick. He soon died without making it to the Jordan River. He was baptized soon before his death by an Arian bishop. In the last years of his life, Constantine made plans for a campaign against Persia. Constantine planned to be baptized in the Jordan River before crossing into Persia. Persian diplomats came to Constantinople over the winter of 336 and 337, seeking peace, but Constantine turned them away. The campaign was called off, however, when Constantine became sick in the spring of 337. Constantine had known death would soon come. Within the Church of the Holy Apostles, Constantine had secretly prepared a final resting place for himself. It came sooner than he had expected. Soon after the Feast of Easter in 337, Constantine fell serious, seriously ill. He left Constantinople for the hot baths near his mother's city of Helenopolis, on the southern shores of the Gulf of Nic Nicomedia. There, in a church his mother built in honor of Lucian, the apostle, he prayed, and there he realized that he was dying. Seeking purification, he became a catechumen, and he attempted to return to Constantinople, making it only as far as a suburb of Nicomedia. He summoned the bishops and told them of his hope to be baptized in the Jordan River, where Christ was written to have been baptized. He requested the baptism right away, promising to live a more Christian life should he live through his illness. The bishops, Eusebius records, performed the sacred ceremonies according to custom. He chose the Aaronizing Bishop Eusebius of Nicomedia, bishop of the city where he lay dying, as his baptizer. Now that we have the stories of Moses from the Old Testament and also events in the life of Emperor Constantine in the New Testament, we can see all the amazing parallels between the two. It was Moses who, after a long slavery and oppression in Egypt, was to deliver God's chosen people and start their journey towards the Promised Land. Constantine legalized Christianity after a long period of persecution at the hands of the Roman Empire. He set the church on a journey that would eventually end with the church ruling over the Roman Empire.
Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh and was a prince of Egypt. There was another prince of Egypt, Ramses, who would become Pharaoh and rule over Egypt. Constantine lived in the brief period of the Tetrarchy, where there were two emperors of Rome. Constantine and his rival Maxentius were both heirs to the imperial thrones. Moses' mother was an Israelite and had a son who was prince of Egypt. She was a member and a believer in the covenant that God made with the nation of Israel. Constantine's mother was Saint Helena, and she had a son who became the emperor of Rome. She was a member and a believer in the covenant that God made with the Catholic Church. Moses ran away from Egypt to save his life, since Pharaoh was seeking to kill him. And it was while he was far away in Midian that he was given his authority and his mission. Constantine ran away from the court of Galerius, the emperor of Rome. Galerius had tried to kill him on several occasions. Constantine went as far as Britain. It was there that he would be made emperor and he was given his authority. Moses was born an Israelite. However, after his birth, he was given up by his mother. It is possible that Moses himself wasn't circumcised. On his way to Egypt to free God's people, God tries to kill Moses. Moses definitely delayed the circumcision of his son, and perhaps of himself as well. Upon God trying to kill Moses, his wife acted quickly and circumcised her son, and perhaps also Moses. Although Constantine legalized Christianity, and also protected it to a certain degree, Constantine himself was not a baptized Christian and therefore was not part of the church. He wasn't baptized until right before his death. Moses was told by God to mark the doorposts of the Israelite houses with lamb's blood. Thus, the angel of death would descend on the city and only kill the firstborn of those whose doorposts were not marked. After the death of the Egyptians, Israel was set free from their bondage. Constantine saw a vision and a sign in the sky. He was told that he would conquer under this sign. Constantine marked the shields of his soldiers with this sign, and he, de he defeated Maxentius in battle. It was Constantine, after this victory, that would set the Christians free from the threat of persecution in the Roman Empire. After the Israelites were set free from Egypt, Pharaoh pursued them into the desert. Moses split the Red Sea, and the Israelites passed through. Pharaoh followed, and when his army was in the middle of the water, trapped, the sea collapsed, and Pharaoh and his army were drowned. Constantine came to Rome to besiege the city and defeat Maxentius. Standard military wisdom would have told Maxentius to stay in the city and wait out the siege. He chose to go out and meet Constantine at Milvian Bridge over the Tiber River. Maxentius got himself and his army trapped by the narrow constraint of the bridge 
and ended up drowning to death in the Tiber River, along with a large part of his army. Moses was a great prophet of the Israelites. He freed them from bondage and led them towards the Promised Land. However, because of his disobedience to God, he was told by God that he wouldn't enter the Promised Land. In order to get to the Promised Land, the Israelites had to cross the Jordan River. Moses died before the Israelites got to the Jordan River. Constantine was on his way to Persia. Along the way, he planned on stopping at the Jordan River to be baptized. However, he became very ill and couldn't make the journey. He turned back and was baptized by an Arian bishop. Just like Moses, he didn't quite cross the finish line since he was a baptized Arian. He also, like Moses, didn't make it to the Jordan River before he died. <laughs> 